This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. I hope y'all are completely ready to lose your minds. If you've ever played this game, you know that nothing makes sense in the first playthrough. Or the second. Or the third. Or actually nothing makes sense unless you really start digging to understand the narrative. Which is actually really freaking cool and ambitious when you figure it out. I think I've figured it out, but we'll see. Treyarch really for the longest was always pushing the boundaries with what a COD game could be. Between Black Ops 1 with the mind control narrative, Black Ops 2 with the multiple endings, and then Black Ops 3 with the story barely concerned with factions and terrorists and more focused on death. What happens when we die, how to maybe avoid it and make that journey as peaceful as possible, just makes all these campaigns infinitely more interesting than other ones. Before we even jump into the campaign, we get to choose our gender and customize our character. At first, this feels like an erasure of the main character having any identity, but it really enhances the story that they are trying to tell as our character is literally named Player. And we die in the first mission, experience everything through Taylor. I love this because my interpretation of why they never named our PCs because Corvus and the DNI is sort of a meta thing Black Ops 3 is doing with us, the actual player, using our consoles to interface with Taylor's memories. Or it's because it really doesn't matter who or what our character is, since this story is more focused on exploring this concept than anything else. To bolster my theory, every time we load in or out of a mission, we see the Coalescence interfacing logo, i.e. us, players, interfacing with the story. Black Ops 3 really went hardcore with specialist hero abilities, and we are given a host of these unique abilities to use in the campaign. A lot of people hated this, but I absolutely loved it. Am I biased because Black Ops 3 is my favorite COD game in every aspect? Yes. Is it still a win? Yes. Speaking of bias, I actually do have one for the genre that Raid Shadow Legends falls into and Raid itself. It's a super easy, fun mobile game to just pick up and play for a few rounds while you're on your commute, waiting in the doctor's office, or even playing in the background while playing other games. Yes, I've done this, which makes me a real gamer, okay? Raid has got a lot to offer, but nothing is more challenging and rewarding than their end game in the Doom Tower, which is basically a giant prison. The floors themselves are a bit of a cakewalk, but the real thing to sink your teeth into are the bosses you go up against at the end. Each requires a specific mechanic derived from your different champions to defeat, like the Scarab King, who must not be at max HP, and you must attack him with a shield buff on if you have any hope to do any damage. Building and itemizing the champions is by far my favorite part of this game. And this month, Raid has just released a new dungeon, if Doom Tower wasn't enough for you, called the Twin Irons Fortress, along with the new feature, Awakening. When you awaken a champ, you get to choose a powerful new blessing to place upon them. And on top of that, Raid has a legendary version of the champion Death Knight, now known as, well, Ultimate Death Knight. And everyone can get him for free, just have to log in and play for 7 days between now and October 27th. If you've never played Raid, now is the perfect time to give it a try. Use code DKRISES for a bunch of free items and instantly level your new strongest champ to level 55 star. If you haven't started yet, click the link in the description or scan my QR code here and get all these unique bonuses you see on screen worth $30 including free champion Vergus. All this treasure will be waiting for you here. It's that easy. Just click the link in the description and I'll see you in game. We are given a hub space between missions somewhat reminiscent of Mason in the chair of Black Ops 1. Everything we do here could be done through menus, but it's a nice little way of immersing us that really isn't too cumbersome. Once again, we are given the option to create our own loadout before each mission, which makes even more sense than in Black Ops 2, since each of the missions we are reliving in Taylor's consciousness, and we really can just take whatever we want. Human bio-augmentation has become commonplace throughout the developed world. Superstorms continue to hammer the region, hampering relief efforts. There's a greater story here about bio-augmentation and what has become of the world with these developments, and Shark easily could have made a good story handling these themes, and it would have been much easier to follow. Shark really wanted to push the boundaries and make a story that isn't so clear cut, and I really have to commend their bravery in doing something so bad sh I'm really surprised that Activision went for it. Hell, they probably didn't understand it either and just took it at face value of destroy the corrupted traitors. Protesters and local forces clashed again today. Really giving me Cortes Dia vibes. I'll bring it up one more time because I really would have loved a direct sequel to Black Ops 2 like we all expected. They had all the pieces to set up a futuristic story that jump started off what Menendez did. But, but, it's okay. Find enjoyment in what we have, right? Kind of the thesis of this channel. No mistake, this is a new Cold War. <laughs> Treyarch really cannot resist having some type of Cold War in their games. Like literally, the last four games they've made have had one. 
There's a big theme in these cutscenes with ravens. Ravens are often a bad omen, and they are constantly used when disgusting DNI and Corvus, mainly associated with loss and, and Native American cultures, have to do with the shifting of consciousness. Like, this game knew what it was doing and what it wanted to be, even if the execution was lost on all of us. We may not always see our enemies, but they are out there. As this is said, we are shown a flock of ravens and a fire of orange light placed in the eye. Later with Taylor, we see his eyes take on this orange glow when we are fighting for control of his body and dealing with Corvus, that unseen enemy. Just so we're clear, if this goes wrong, you never existed. And it does go wrong for our player character. And during this line, we are shown snow indicating the frozen forest. At the beginning of each mission, we are given this giant wall of text that swings by too fast to read. Does it suck that there is so much information that basically explains the story? Kinda. But upon reflection, I really like it because interfacing with DNI happens almost instantaneously. So our player would understand and read these journal entries by Taylor just like that. I also like that they go so fast, we don't believe there is anything actually worth reading on our first go to not have anything spoiled for us with what's exactly going on. Sometimes piecing together and figuring out the story is more rewarding than just straight up experiencing it. Such as this first text telling us that we were pronounced dead before we ever even get to play. Had we known that, it would have made things start to click, and I don't think Treyarch wanted that with this story. Get out! I always love stuff like this. Seeing something on the screen, and then directly to you. Did you know there were other prisoners? The minister is the only priority. Hendrix starts being a little soft when he sees Khalid. For a moment, we think it's just because, you know, prisoners, really good guys, we need to help. But we'll come to find out these boys have history. There are a lot of moments like these that hint to the plot twist. Son of a is never funny. You sound like the voice of experience. Trust me, I am. Is this foreshadowing? Because, like, we think the game is in chronological order. Pre-shadowing? Post-shadowing? Can you fight, Khalil? Always. We'll grab a weapon from the locker room up ahead and reprogram it to match your biometrics. Picking up other weapons really isn't a big deal with the amount of ammo boxes Black Ops 3 gives us, but it's also a bit of neat world building. Locking out guns so your enemy can't use them seems like a good idea in theory. Also, like, we can get an attack mod to allow for us to unlock them. Speaking of attack mods, they're a neat little campaign exclusive ability to spice up the gameplay. Your orders were to extract the minister. His name is Lieutenant Khalil. Sound familiar? Get moving. We'll see you topside. Just like that, Taylor changes mission priority. Given their history, I understand. Also, they know each other, and this is the last mission in the timeline. Taylor showing us the moves, enhanced by his cybernetics and DNI. You'll notice that Hendrix doesn't have any augmentations right here. He never gets a DNI or a cybernetics. There's never a scene where we are shown him getting it, which leads to the question of why he is able to interface with consoles and stuff in later missions. I believe that the simulation Taylor interfaced mine with player didn't want to believe that Hendrix was acting erratic and upset of his own free will and blamed the DNI virus, which he never had DNI. Rachel? That didn't work out. Remember that line and notice the bandana on his arm. It's in the same place where Taylor is wounded at the end. Very important details to understand the timeline and what is and isn't real in the memory missions. Take care of him as good as you did me. That's not funny, man. This is so, so cool because one, to us, it sets up Hendrick's ability to treat us the way he does throughout. And two, building the honest history these two men actually shared that we actually do get to see. Let's roll. Stay close. Now we're getting introduced to the main selling point of Black Ops 3, which is the cybernetic soldiers and all the fixings that come with that. The fire is mine. You know I gotta win the sauce. Comes easy now, doesn't it, Taylor? Referencing his DNI and enhancements. You didn't answer me, John. And Taylor doesn't answer because after the implants, he's not entirely proud of doing it, and two, not exactly himself anymore. The presentation is really terrifying. Killing machines coming through the smoke Terminator style. Real good intro to one of our mainstay enemies. It may not be a mission priority, but there's still people, damn it! Or have you changed so much that you've forgotten what that feels like? There is the obvious theme of the enhancers making us more like robots and humans, which isn't explored too much, but I'm still happy to see a bit of it. Black Ops 3 really just went ham sandwich on this turret section. Literally everything explodes. This is some terrifyingly brutal shit. Feels even worse because of the cold nature of the battle bot. With it not being personal and just a program, it makes it scarier to watch it happen. Hey, still with us? A line that would be used constantly, referring to player actually dying and having complications with interfacing with Taylor. Headed to the Zurich headquarters of the Coalescence Corporation. Our uh, cargo, prototype for the Winslow Accord Neural Network Initiative. 
So this game throws out a lot of names. Winslow, CDP, 54 Immortals. There's complaints that none of this is explained and we don't understand the motives of any of these factions. Like I keep saying, we are purposely not supposed to because that's not the focus of this game. I really believe this story is meant to be played once, then again after understanding what's really happening. <laughs> At 7.31 a.m. This is the fun stuff that games set in the future are allowed to do. On top of the straight up acid trip that is the final mission. We're connected. All of this is a simulation inside our minds. Little did we realize how much we really meant by that. And they took it hard. Outcome, train go boom. My God, the best thing to come out of Black Ops 3, I swear. The great multiplayer and zombies? Nah, try and go boom. I actually really liked the advanced movement once there was a recharge on the abilities. Really raised the skill ceiling for the game. Path mode will highlight inbound threats such as rockets and grenades. The DNI offers not just story elements, but also enhances the gameplay. I have to turn mine to low UI elements, but they could be really useful if you choose to use them. Hey, it's okay. It's okay. This is poised as PTSD, which... Yeah, but every time the screen starts getting pixelated, it's when player is losing their grip on life. Doctor can straighten it out. You just need to recalibrate your meds. Trust me, you're gonna be fine. So this is where player actually dies. We can see Taylor fighting to not have our life support unplugged. It's still a bit up in the air if Kruger did it on purpose or not. The botched assault, man. It took six hours for the ZSF to get that information. Outcome? Train go boom. Zerk security force got their asses handed to him. Outcome. Train go boom. Some knowledge is worth earning. Appreciating. Treyarch at understanding the story, probably. Okay, new blood. From this point on, the simulation deviates from actual events. Not that it's gonna feel any less real. With our recent death, this is why we have stuff happening that never did when reliving Taylor's memories. But the associated subconscious interference will leave him brain dead. Dead. Believe me, this is a bad way to go. Oh, foreshadowing to her eventual death. Hmm. But you just learned that your DNI took the ZSF weeks to uncover. What do you think I'm gonna say next? Outcome, train go boom. There was no way to stop it and get off the train. Your DNI might show you all the options, but only you can decide what you're willing to sacrifice. Kind of the whole idea surrounding Taylor's character. Sacrificing his entire team, then later becoming a terrorist himself, attacking coalescence, his relationship with Kane, seemingly Hendrix, and in the end, player. Sometimes, you have to let go. Taylor, how's our patient? As good as can be expected. We see the moment Kane left Taylor, framed as player. Welcome back. Being prepped for surgery now, it's gonna be okay. And this moment is a distorted memory of Taylor. Instead of Kane speaking to Taylor, it's him to player, promoting the surgery where Kane did not want him to go through with it. Hendrix wasn't even injured on the mission. He volunteered for this. My God, it's actually really well done. This is so seemingly taking place after Ethiopia, but actually after they killed Taylor, i.e. Dylan Stone. Confusing? Yes. Fun as hell? 100%. And Hendrix getting the DNI is also a distortion of the simulation, since we literally see him with human boy arms and talking smack on Taylor's decision in the opening mission. Explosion at the old coalescence facility killed 300,000. And now it's a ghost town. The mission description says day zero. Works for both the op of going into Singapore and players' first missions out with the DNI. And if you read the pre-mission protocols, it will spell out, We are Taylor. Just like in Black Ops 1 with Reznov is dead. Player is seen sometimes with the mask on and others without. This is to add to the ambiguity of who really is underneath there. Warlords are one of the few boss type enemies in Black Ops 3. Bosses aren't something we see often in COD games and are a welcome change of pace. At this point in the story, Taylor doesn't have a DNI and I really can't find an explanation for moments like these other than the simulation trying to make it all seem real to player. What do you all think? Kane's got her bandana here so we know it takes place pre-op and she's really here. Safe. Turn that shit off. These operatives were murdered by Stone and his team because of their work on DNI, and we hear this radio playing about the frozen forest. This could be what they actually heard, or it could be Corvus starting to get through. Denial of reincarnation. Funny considering Player, in a sense, is trying to reincarnate in Taylor's body, which is exactly what Stone's team was seeking to put an end to. The 54 Immortals. The name is derived from Chinese numerology, literally translating to never dying immortals. 
Once again, with another boss enemy. I'm really amazed we never got to pilot one of these mechs. Just like we did when we wiped the black station data at the dock. Better not mess up my brain, Kane. I won't. But you may not like what you see. We never saw him use his DNI to wipe the black site station. So I believe Kane just used him as a conduit to remove the data as he didn't have a DNI. Hence his fear of being scrambled. Black Ops 3 could have been played in co-op, just like Advanced Warfare. Probably would have enjoyed it a bit more going on this acid trip of a game with a friend. Kane. Tell him what you told me. Every time we see Ravens from here on out, it will have directly to do with the simulation switching all the members of Dylan Stone's team with Taylor's team. Ravens and Norse, especially Odin's Ravens, have an affinity for spying and quickly flying over all of Midgard, gathering much information and seeing true, which is ironic considering the false life we're being shown. Much of the structure was destroyed in the disaster. Our best option is to descend through the central- We see Hendrix's eye transition from electronic to human. Trust nothing! The traditional Call of Duty stealth mission isn't shoved in your face in Black Ops 3. We were given the option of either stealth or going loud. You know what they say about staring into the abyss. That the abyss stares back at you. Meaning and hinting at Taylor's eventual DNI and Hendrix killing Stone. These next moments give me big guilty spark vibes from the mystery of what's going on, the blood trails, to the eventual ambushes. Man, these robots are really just the mechanical equivalent of our zombies. Does this arena give anyone else big where angels fear to tread vibes from Borderlands 2? So each of these 10 members never actually got interfaced with. They were just eliminated by Hendrix and Taylor. Diaz, Hall, and Moretti die due to the infection of their DNI. Corvus and the Frozen Forest keep their consciousness uploaded and make it possible for us to interact with them in this simulation. Is it just me or is this eagle meant to evoke the same imagery that the Nazis used? I mean, they both used human test subjects against their will after all. We gotta crouch behind here and don't see the carnage, only just little ghibli bits flying, adding to the horror of this execution. Well, that's some great morbid camera work. There's still a chance. Hey, do you hear me? She's dead. Accept it. Of course, I was confused on why player cared so much about getting Kane out during this mission. So the reveal of this being Taylor's lady love made all this sweeter. I'm glad we wrapped up with this lady quickly because she was not the focus and it really didn't matter too much. Went out in a fun, gruesome way, though, so that's cool. Hey. You still with us? And now that in the simulation our DNI has been unplugged, not unlike our life support, we will be constantly being checked on if we are still present. Very similar to how a doctor and nurse might try to constantly keep you awake to not go towards the light. Essential supplies are low. How are you still holding on? You can thank Raul Menendez. What? Raul Menendez was a hypocritical egomaniac. Ah, so I was onto something in the Black Ops 2 video. And also, this is our only mention of Black Ops 2, and I got really giddy when I heard this name. Maybe so, but I wouldn't thank Menendez. He was a prick who got what he deserved. Mindy died in canon confirmed. I do not know or care who you are. I know I keep saying it, but this game is rough to win. The only interesting thing about it is the twist. Anyway, Salim saying this makes us question things because he should know who we are. We saved him in the opening mission. And I demand to speak to a legal representative. That would be me. Have a seat. Player plays good cop and Hendrix plays bad cop. Let him run away. These men right here. Do you know them? Ah, uh, poor Hall. Man, this was an awesome way to get a dog's type kill streak in the future setting. It's not often, but at least sometimes we get the little vignette scenes that used to make Cod King Pain so much more immersive. A moment that's more interesting if we view it as players, since the bot and the attack he used is very similar to the one they suffered in the opening missions. Just more red herrings to what's actually going on. Instead of Taylor saving us, it's Hendrix. These two buds, man. I'm only finding out about this tracker right now. You and Kane into keeping secrets from me? You need to back off, Hendrix. Because they in love, buddy boy. That's why you didn't tell him about the tracker he slipped Salim. Ah, the water player gave him wasn't a good cop. It's how he got the tracker in him. Salim helped with the frozen forest and has a glowing orange stomach just like Corvus when we met them. The hall boss fight is pretty fun. That is all. Please don't. So this is what we do now? Kill our own because they blew open a conspiracy in our own backyard. Works for both. What really happened is Taylor opened the mech to confirm the kill and after seeing Alice dead, then Hendrix said this. This decomposition is pretty realistic. When we decompose, we will blow it up and get those red eyes before withering away completely to a skeleton. I remember, but it's almost like it was a dream. Like it was happening to someone else. Woo! It was happening to Alice Conrad. I studied it at the academy. I cited it in my final paper as one of the greatest examples of courage and bravery in military history. So Corvus can't create memories, or 
anything for that matter. It can only use what it has learned from others who have a DNI. The Frozen Force was chosen by it as its location from Hall's research. And since she cited it as the greatest example of courage and bravery in military history, no wonder Corvus would choose the location for its soldiers to pass on in peace, picking a place that displayed both courage and bravery. Two things many will need if to face death with peace. The first old boy we see in this World War II power is Private Miller, baby! This is when Black Ops 3 started to get really interesting, and I wish they delved even more into this alternate reality for the whole game. But by the time we got there, the staff were already dead. Carved to pieces by a 54 Immortals Enforcer by the name of Jay Zhang. We knew they'd send a wet work team after us. We had no choice but to cut a deal with the Immortals and get the hell out of Singapore. That wasn't what happened, Sarah. Sarah's telling the truth because it wasn't actually her that did that. And this is kind of when things get even weirder, because Taylor's real team in real life died of the infection of Corvus. And in the timeline, they died at the same time as their stone team counterparts. So I believe that each of Taylor's team was actually with Taylor and Hendrix in the real timeline during these moments. Hence why Hall mentions cutting a deal with the Immortals because Player and Hendrix do that next mission. In the context of them murdering these CIA guys. And in Provocation, the robots that ambush and save us are actually Hall, Moretti, and Diaz. But there are four bots, and we are Taylor, so how does that work? I'm going to say the simulation made a fourth bot for Taylor, since we are in control. You'll notice in that mission, a bot throws someone over the ledge like we do later in Lotus Towers. And the two teams were both doing similar things in the same locations, so the descriptions Hall gives of the goings-on works for both Stone and Taylor's team in the real timeline. You have to stay with me. Just like player's consciousness, hers is fading. We use the same lines to keep her from passing over. Project was under the direct command of Sebastian Kruger, a senior executive. When Kruger's name is brought up, we get a remix of the zombies theme when a new round starts. When we hear his name, we've got a new target, and in a way, a new round has started. And we also got zombies on the way, so. And my best theory on why there are zombies here is this is what Corvus does to people with DNI after enough time. Okay. Kane. Ooh, Kane doesn't have her bandana. And since Taylor never actually interfaced with Conrad, Kane wouldn't have come up to him here, and Taylor wouldn't have any information about the Frozen Forest. This is all player constructing Kane to talk about Corvus. Tell me exactly what happened when you interfaced with Hall. Hall's brain looks like neurons connecting, but also like tree limbs, i.e. Frozen Forest. That's how Taylor actually killed Conrad, not through interfacing. She didn't know what was happening to her. And as Player says this, we watch a raven fly through this puddle. A mirror image, referencing the real world events, and Player simulated one. Man, after going to Hall's head, going to a normal mission like this is really underwhelming. But I'm sure that's why Treyarch put us in this VTOL to spice things up. That is a hell of a swim. She wasn't there when we got there, and this is preying on what we expect out of games, having our NPCs just show up during the cutscene. But notice again, no bandana. Only to the sound of my voice. Imagine yourself in a frozen forest. You're getting pixelated again, here in Corvus. This is player's consciousness inside Taylor's starting to fade away towards the forest and forest and death. Stay with me. You could read this as Taylor trying to perform CPR in the middle of a hospital player. Whatever it wants, I'm still me. Taylor. So this to me is a construct of the conversation Kane and Taylor had before he got the surgery. And this Taylor is her actually talking to Taylor as she romantically grabs his hand. We can find another way. A way outside the military, outside the CIA. There are places we can go, places we can be safe. Please, listen to me. Stay with me. This is also referencing the conversation before going under, talking about leaving away together. The simulation is failing right now as players are getting closer to the light. Notice Hendrix popping up out of nowhere. And also, does this mission remind anyone of the mission Cortana from Halo 3? The momentary slowdowns and Corvus talking to us like Gravemind in Halo? As Moretti dies, we see him fall into the frozen forest. That peace before death and we see it as players since we are right there with him. That's just an awesome visual right there. Throughout this mission, we get a lot of pixels and ravens as this is the last mission we truly see as player through Taylor's consciousness. Taylor's mind is overloading. I think it's causing bleed through into its other hosts. We're bleeding between both timelines right now because Taylor does get infected after he interfaces with player and that's what Kane is talking about right now. Not the fake Taylor we are seeing in the sim. 
Until zombies really started to jump to the shark, this was kind of the biggest boss battle we've ever had in a COD game. Out. God, that is brutal. Imagine yourself in a frozen forest. Hang in there, I'm on my way. At least he's wishing us a peaceful death. If you go through with this, I can't be with you. This is the only way. It's going to change you. Taylor was wounded fighting Stone, and after Kane picked him up, opted to get a DNA in cybernetics. And we see why in the first mission, Kane and him didn't work out. Don't forget the person that you were. Alluding to player and Taylor becoming one. Maybe you can change things. You just need to wake up. But we are already dead. All the mission info here is all scrambled. This mission takes place inside Taylor's head primarily, but also a bit in real time attacking coalescence. Something I've yet to mention is how punchy the audio design is. I remember when I first played Black Ops 3 and heard those grenades explode, I could not get over it. You still in there? Checking for player or Taylor. At this point, things are pretty rough to discern. What were they messing with here, Kane? Ever heard of Nova 6? Woo, reference to Black Ops 1. Warnings posted in error, all systems nominal. Heard sequence initiated. It lied to us. It can make you believe things that aren't even real. King, please! I, who knows what's real or not throughout this ending sequence. Uh, Rachel! Uh, Rachel! 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 Hey, you still with us? I'm going to do my best to wrap my head around this ending. Even with all the research I've done, I'm still like, what's happening? You've been fighting it. We all have. You just need to relax. Corvus is just a physical embodiment of death. I need an answer. Me asking Treyarch about this game story. It was always about control. Of course the CIA is always about control. If the only way to prevent future attacks is to monitor the thoughts and desires of the population, then the choice is obvious. We need to know who our enemies are and what they are planning. That is how we save lives. They could have done both the acid trip in Taylor's mind and done a commentary on the NSA Patriot Act. I mean, hell, Black Ops 2 is kind of putting the ball in the T for Black Ops 3. Still, Char kind of did, so I'll give it to him. I can't do this anymore. You're going down a path that I can't follow. This is Hendrix talking to Taylor about getting his DNI. Also, Hendrix is basically Padme. I lost you a long time ago, Hendrix. <laughs> Referring to Hendrix leaving Taylor on Lotus Towers. I've told you everything. An answer. To know the purpose for which I was created. I think we can all relate to Corvus, but I swear if we were ever given an answer, we'd probably be just as disappointed as Corvus is. You just stay with me. We'll get through this. Everything that happens from here is pretty much the final moments of player on the hospital bed before death. This mission feels like the training grounds for the Revelation Zombies map. Who are you? I don't even know your name! This is Taylor struggling right now and plays into our PC being named player. It only took till near the end of the game to have the quick cutting editing we know and love from Black Ops. Let your mind relax. Let your thoughts drift. And what you could interpret this entire game as is that Corvus was never real and it was just Taylor speaking to you the entire time, trying to comfort us as we pass on. What's your name, soldier? In a frozen forest. I said, what's your name? Taylor. And that's the giant ass plot twist that we were in Taylor's head all along. Also, as our consciousness gets purged from Taylor's mind, that is when we die. And since we're dead, we cut to black and it's over. Jason Blundell is one of the directors on this game, and for anyone who knows his previous work, shouldn't be surprised at the absolute insanity this story was trying to tell. He made Mob to the Dead and Origins and went on to direct for Treyarch Zombies ever since. Dude definitely has some kind of brain on him. And so, yeah. That's Black Ops 3, a really weird, tough game to go through. And I am 100% sure that I missed a lot of things because God, there is a lot going on here while seemingly nothing going on. I really love the concept going on here. It's super sci-fi on one hand, but also really grounded about how humans deal with death on the other. This game feels pulled in many directions though. By augmentation and what that means for humanity, how much freedom and privacy will we strip from society to deal with threats, good soldiers follow orders, our relationship with death, how to conquer it or accept it. There's a lot going on and not nearly enough time to explore each idea, made even worse because it's a COD campaign where not many resources are poured into it. 
for what it was, I love the idea. Playing it is a complete other story, as honestly, I was just bored going through it. I believe Jason Blundell and his team, given the resources and the time, could have made an amazingly mind campaign. But alas, it's a Call of Duty campaign. Remember, drive the speed limit, drink some water, and love one another. Pizza.